I put it in the announcement. Are you able to find it? I list you. Oh, let me send it to you. Should we get started? 
Should we get started? Cool. Hi everyone. Can the people online hear me? Well, cool. if they can't, maybe you can put it in the chat. Um, and I wish I can fix it. Cool. So yeah, um, welcome. Can can you all hear me in the back? Thanks. Uh, welcome to CSE 6230. Um, I hope you're all in the right place. Today we'll do two separate sections, one on course logistics and the second one on an intro to HPC. Oh, shoot. Apparently not. Yes, OK, hi. Um, so I'm going to try this uh, to implement this course policy of not using laptop and phone. So um, everybody could put away their laptops. Oh, you can keep it. Thanks. Cool. Yes. Um, I would prefer not to use like tablet or electronics. The reason is that there's a lot of research showing that having like electronics can be distracting in the classroom, like um, having something that can do a lot of functionality, um, both to you and other people in the class. So. I'm going to try this this semester. Um, and I'm going to post all the slides and the lecture videos online, so um, you don't even necessarily have to like write down everything on the slides. Cool. So the main point of the class that I want to get across is that I want everybody to feel comfortable with asking questions and being comfortable with answering my questions. Our goal in the class <coughs> is to have interesting discussions that, were, that are going to help to understand the materials, and if anything is unclear or if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to speak up and don't just let me like lecture at you. So you're all here. I guess maybe you have a reason to take it, but the reason that I think you should take this course is that going forward, doing any kind of science is going to require taking full advantage of the computational resources that we have today. And also separately, even if you're not interested in science, performance engineers are in demand in the industry and also in academia. And there are a lot of interesting problems in parallel computing. This is some data. Um, I guess it only does up to 2013, but this is the y-axis. This is the percentage of postings that mention these kind of words, like performance and optimization. And the x-axis is time. You can see that the general trends are going up. So if you're interested in taking a job in the industry, it might be useful to know something about performance and parallel computing. The point of the course is to build upon the theoretical foundations from CSE 6220 and to learn about the practice of high performance computing. So that class is mostly about the theory. It's kind of about algorithm analysis. Um, we're going to do some part of the theory, but also more on the practical side using tools and actually doing coding. The, we're also going to be exposed to a variety of use cases, uh, modern use cases, hopefully, for high performance computing from a lot of different domains. And the goals of the class, everybody's going to have to write high performance parallel and concurrent code. We're going to learn about applications of parallel computers, and we're also going to have to do writing and communication. Yes? Did you say that high performance computing is a prerequisite? Or? Uh, the question was, is high performance computing a prerequisite? No, I don't think so. Uh, we're going to learn. We're going to do most. We're going to do learning from the basics of high performance computing. But I would think it's important to know like C or C++ or some kind of these um, like compiled languages. Um, high performance computing. If you have background in parallel computing, it's a plus. It might make things easier, but you don't need to know anything <coughs> about parallel computing. Yes. Would you say there's a lot of overlapping topics between the two? Uh, the question was, is there a lot of overlap between the two? I think it depends on which 6220 you took, because um, the co topics can vary. I think there's going to be overlap in um, the, like, there's an introductory part in this class, which teaches you kind of like basics of cache performance and stuff like that. So if you know about that, that might have a lot of overlap in 6220, but the later half of like the special topics is not going to have a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so, Kind of going along with your question, we're going to cover locality models and the memory hierarchy, which you might have seen in 6220 if you've taken it before. <laughs> uh, we'll cover IO efficient algorithms and data structures, probably in more depth than we did than if you took 6220, then it was in there. 
uh, common programming language for parallel computing, like OpenMP, MPI, CUDA, and other shared memory programming languages, concurrency control, data parallelism, communication voiding algorithms, which are in sort of with, the, for, with sort of distributed computing, uh, a focus on graph applications. So programming frameworks, data structures, GNNs, which are super popular now, and sparse problems and applications and a whole bunch of other uh, special topics. What we're not gonna cover is a lot of the super basic stuff from 6220, uh, like introductory algorithms and data structures. There are other classes that do that. There's lots of books. I recommend CLRS, which is a classical text on introduction to algorithms. I link this, there's a cheat sheet for asymptotics if you need a refresher. And there's chapters on big O, which we'll use a lot in this class. And um, I'm not going to go really in depth on the advanced theoretical parallel algorithms or concurrent algorithms. Uh, they do that a lot more in 6220. And there's also like related classes on parallel and concurrent algorithms from other universities. Um, yeah, so it would be helpful to know C or C++. There will be a TA review tomorrow online. Um, I think we'll figure out the link. Maybe ideally we would use the same link as we're doing for this lecture. Uh, we can see if that will work. Uh, you should know some algorithms and data structures. It doesn't have to be super advanced algorithms and data structures, but some basics. Um, preferred would be one of the one of these courses on algorithms. And I can't exactly commit to a time requirement that this class would take. It really depends on your background and expertise. Like if you, like I said, if you know about parallel computing already, it might go a lot faster. Um, if you know about algorithms, it probably would go reasonably fast. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, in terms of course logistics, most all of the course materials will be hosted on Canvas. I actually made a course website because I saw that all the other iterations of this class had one, <laughs> but I'm not totally sure why, because all the materials are on Canvas anyway. Um, we're going to host a discussion board on Ed Discussion. And as for academic honesty, there's this academic honor code that probably everybody here is familiar with already. Uh, if you're not sure about some instance of something that you're trying to use, feel free to ask me. Um, yeah, so in terms of academic honesty, plagiarism, probably you've already heard this, but examples include listening while someone dictates a solution, using an example, using an existing written solution to make your solution, or copying another student's code or sharing your code with other students. Instead, we want to do collaboration, which is not copying other people's code, but asking questions on the discussion board, working together to solve the high level problem, doing high level discussions of strategy. And if you collaborate with other students, just declare it up on your report. In terms of AI assistance like ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot and such, uh, we'll treat it in this course in the same way that we treat collaboration with other people. So you can use them, but sort of like as a discussion board, um, not to just directly copy the solution from them, but um, to maybe get ideas and uh, think about uh, think about some topics. Yeah, so we have two TAs. Khan, I think, is not here today, but he's a final year grad student, and he works on graph machine learning, graph algorithms and systems, and high-performance computing, and his office hours will be Wednesday, 1.30 to 2.30. Today, Abhishek is here. Hi. Uh, he's a master's student. I guess you can introduce yourself, actually, because you're here. So I'm Along with, uh, and we will be teaching up the syllabus, <laughs> and uh, we'll be helping out with uh, like, all the questions. And uh, yeah, I think that's all. And you can, you can follow me or. Cool, thanks. Hi, I'm Helen. Uh, until recently, about maybe a few weeks ago, I was a postdoc in Berkeley Lab, which is a national lab next to UC Berkeley. I finished my PhD a couple years ago at MIT, and my research is in high performance computing, parallel algorithms, data structures, and software performance engineering. My office hours will be Thursday, two to three. And I'm excited to meet everyone. Thanks. In terms of assignments, this is all of them. This looks like a lot, but it's okay, because we're gonna do it through the entire semester. Uh, the most important one right now is there's gonna be a pre-course survey, which is just a short Google form survey just asking everyone about their background uh, and what they hope to get out of the class. Um, there will be a pre-proposal, which is a written assignment. There are programming assignments throughout the class. 
we're going to, like I said, there's a special topics module at the end of the class where there's going to be a whole bunch of guests. So we'll have reports on that. And the main component of this class will be a final project. So that will take uh, approximately like the last two ish months <laughs> of the class. There's going to be three parts. One is the proposal. Uh, there's going to be a midpoint report and then the final report. Yeah, so like I said, right now the most urgent thing is this survey is due this Friday and I will post the link. I think the link is already on Canvas actually, but I will post the slides also in case there are issues and also an announcement. Um, yeah, I guess the most important thing about this is that it will help us determine the location of the office hours. I'm not sure actually what is common right now, but there's an option for on the survey to tell like what you prefer. For the first week or so, we'll host them online because it's the most straightforward, but if we need to find a room, if a lot of people prefer in person, we can also do that. Um, the closest non-survey assignment is the pre-proposal, which is going to be next next Thursday, I think next Thursday. And that will be a warm-up exercise to get familiar with reading and evaluating papers on parallel applications. So basically what we're going to do is everybody will find a paper that they want to read on a parallel application, ideally one that they're interested in. Um, and you can find, I actually will not provide a list of samples. You can actually um, do whatever paper you want as long as it's verifiable. Um, I put on the assignment on Canvas, I gave a couple of like conferences that are good sources like supercomputing and there's one like parallel programming conference that's a good source for these systems level um, parallel applications. And in the pre-proposal, there's two parts. One is to talk about your background and your research interests. And ideally, we'll use this information if we want or if necessary to help find projects partners later on if you don't already have a group coming into the class. And the second one is to write the summary of this paper and you can pick a problem from your own research area if you're already familiar with one, the internet or anywhere else. And uh, the assignment is to describe the application, the relationship to parallelism and assessment of its success, weaknesses and challenges. So this is just a way to get familiar with what these papers look like in this area and maybe get an idea for what you want to do in your final project. There will be programming assignments throughout the course. Um, there's this PACE ICA, which is this instructional cluster. There's instructions on the slide. I will post the slides. There's also instructions um, on Canvas about how to access the cluster. You should all have access to it already, like automatically through this class. In total, there will be five programming assignments due before a class on the specified day, about every week and a half or so. First one is cache friendly parallel programming. It will be released tomorrow. Um, there will be shared memory programming, data level parallelism, MPI, and CUDA. So MPI is like distributed computing, and CUDA is for GPUs. And we'll submit the code and any other deliverables through Canvas. Oh, somebody is waiting. Okay. Um, for the final project, there will be groups of three. If the class number is not divisible by three, we will figure it out. Uh, Every group will choose a project that is relevant to the course topics, requires significant programming effort from everyone in the group, is unique, so not every every group has to do something different and is approved by me, so I will read all the proposals. And we'll provide some sample project topics, and you're also free to choose your own, like if you have interests outside of the class or if you come up with some during the pre-proposal. And we ask that you host the code on GitHub, and we'll provide some tutorial later in the semester about how to use it. So there's, like I said, there's three phases. The first one is the proposal. In the proposal, every group is going to come up with a write-up and a pr presentation for the proposal, which is uh, just saying what you're going to do in your final project. And the exact format will be posted later in the semester. The write-up will have the problem statement, the approach that you are going to use to solve the problem, an evaluation plan. So this part is actually, I find it the most challenging. An evaluation plan means like, in what way are you going to test that your proposed approach actually worked? So for example, like, what experiments might you run or what metrics might you test it on to show that it's better than what it is already out there and a weekly timeline of expected milestones. And these will be due right before the spring break and the last two classes before the spring break are going to be um, for presentations for the proposals. About halfway through the project timeline, every group will submit a midpoint report saying the progress that they made so far and the breakdown of the contributions so far. So who worked on which component any obstacles they encountered, their revised approach, if there were any obstacles, or even if there were not obstacles, maybe 
still might have learned something in the first half. Uh, so you might change your approach and a weekly schedule of the remaining work to be done. And the midpoint report is just to make sure that everyone is making progress and to catch any issues so we don't run into huge issues right before the deadline. And finally, there's this last part, which is the final project write up this. So again, similar to the proposal, there will be a presentation and a write up. And uh, the final write up will be kind of like a typical research paper, like introduction, methods, results, things like that. And we'll spend the last few lecture slots doing final presentations. And I'll post more uh, information about each of these components and proposal, midpoint, and final on Canvas, like format and template and all of this stuff. All of the things related to the final project, like the proposal, the midpoint report, and the pre-proposal should be in LaTeX. Uh, we'll attach templates on the assignments on Canvas, and I will also paste this on Canvas. Mm -hmm. So is the final project concurrent with the five other projects of the class? You mean the homeworks? Yeah, the homeworks, sorry. The final homework is due before the proposal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know it's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question, I think. Yes. You can form your group on your own. If people don't have a group that coming into the class, I'll post on Canvas, not on Canvas, on a discussion, um, like a thread saying, like to make a thread for people to comment like if they don't have a group member to look for other group members. Does that make sense? And if you need help, we can talk later about finding a group. Thanks. OK. Again, every component of the final project should be your own writing and code. You can't copy it from other groups of the web or other papers. Um, plagiarism will not be tolerated. In the honor code, it says that plagiarism should be reported to the office. Um, and I hope that I don't have to use this. Uh, finally, there will be guest lecture reports. So after the spring break, uh, like I said, there will be no more homeworks, but we will have guest lectures. So it'll be a lot of special topics. And uh, the guest lectures will all be online, but I'll be here if people want to come. And I'm just going to run them in hybrid mode. And for every guest lecture, I ask that you turn in just like a small summary, maybe one or two pages of the lecture, sort of similar to the pre-proposal, but it should be lightweight. And for every guest lecture, you'll have one week to do it. Um, yeah, in terms of the due dates, every assignment is due right before the class on the deadline day. For the following assignments, you can get two days extension for 20% penalty. So for the programming assignments, the guest lectures and the pre-proposal, um, but not for the survey and the final project components like the proposal, midpoint, final report. Mm -hmm. Oh, then uh, then there would no, be no penalty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Other question? OK. This is just the grade breakdown, like the percent that each thing is worth. So the survey is 1%, the proposal is 2%. There are five programming assignments. Each one will be 5%, so the total is 25%. The guest lecture summary, there are going to be six guest lectures times two, so that's 12. Um, the project proposal, there's two parts, the write-up and the presentation. Each one will be 9%, so that's 18%. The midpoint is 6%. Final project is 18% times 2, so there's, again, the write-up and the presentation. That's 36, and you can trust me that this adds up to 100. Mm -hmm. Are the guest lectures going to be recorded? Yes, everything will be recorded. I'll post them on Canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, there's also potential to get extra credit. So similar to the group proposal, you can choose up to two papers to write reports like summaries and assessments of. Uh, you can choose your own, uh, and each one will be the same worth as the pre-proposal, so up to 2%, so for a total of 4%. So you can choose to do either zero, one, or two of these. And yeah, you can choose your own papers. I can post a list of papers, like maybe later in the semester if people would like, but you're also free to choose your own. Yeah, so that's, that's what I just said, it's up to four 
So I guess at max you could get 104. Um, yes. Cool. Uh, so for questions throughout the semester, for technical questions about the homework or the project, you can use the discussion board. Uh, don't email me or the TAs about technical questions. If you want to use the late policy, you can email the TAs directly. And if you have any other questions, you can email me. Cool, thank you. Uh, so that was the first part, which was the logistics. Yes? Could you say it again? Uh, the question is, can you talk about pass failing the course? Um, I actually don't know about the policy, the school policy for pass fail. Let me look at it and get back to you. I know there's like a grading, traditional grading scale from the school, so I guess the pass fail would just be based on that. Um, either the cutoff is at C or D, I don't know. Um, let me check on it and get back to you. As for auditing, uh, so I just looked it up today. Um, for auditing, there's no, there's not like a real grade assigned. Like I think they said on the course policy, it counts towards your credit limit, but not towards your GPA. Uh, and everybody just gets like a V as the rating or as the grade. So there's, <coughs> you don't have to hand in anything if you're auditing the class. Um, you can hand in assignments. Uh, we won't grade them, but you can hand them in. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yes. Thanks. So that is done with logistics. All of that information and more is in the syllabus, which is posted on Canvas. And um, yeah, if there's any questions, feel free to post on the discussion board about the logistics. And there's oh, there's also a I made like a Google calendar, so you can add it to your calendar to remind you of the deadlines if that would also help. Cool. So yeah, so let's now talk about something more interesting about this introduction to HPC. So presumably everybody is here because they're interested in HPC or parallel computing in some capacity. So the goal of the class is to learn practical performance engineering, how to write fast code and use cases for writing fast code. And that includes parallel computing, but it's not only limited to parallel computing. Um, the reason that we are interested in writing fast code is because it saves us time and energy. And the way we're gonna do it is through parallelism, but also through locality and specialization, because as we will see, parallelism alone is not enough to get the full performance out of your machine. And uh, yeah, and parallelism is just using multiple <coughs> processors at the same time uh, to solve problems more quickly than you would just using one processor. What is a parallel computer? So there's a lot of different types of parallel computers, but the first one, the most common one is called a shared memory multiprocessor or SMP. And this just connects multiple processors in a single memory system. So this is like a cartoon of what it looks like. You have one giant shared memory and you have a network and these are multiple processors and they each are connected through the memory, but they're not connected to each other. So they can communicate through the shared memory, um, but they cannot communicate directly. And these are all independent and you can assign them arbitrary tasks. And that is an example, this one, of like a common Intel chip, so they have the shared L3 cache that we can all access, and there's also a shared DRAM, that picture, and there's multiple cores in this picture, there's eight. And if you go even one level bigger than that, a distributed memory multiprocessor has processors each with their own memories connected by this high-speed network, and this is also called a cluster, and this is what we have on the instructional cluster, so like each of these is what I just showed you in the previous slide. So like this, each of these might also have multiple cores in it, but each of these is like a separate machine and they have to communicate through this network um, and they can send messages to each other, but not, but they notably, they don't have a shared memory in between them. So they have to pass messages directly. And an HPC system is one of these distributed memory machines, but it has like hundreds or thousands of these nodes. The fastest computers for science have been parallel for a really long time. Um, there's this list called Top 500, which has the fastest computers in the world, which are like all these giant supercomputers. And it's updated twice a year, once in November, I think. I don't remember when the other time is, but it's updated twice a year. And these computers um, are on the order of thousands of nodes. Currently, the largest one on the Top 500 is Frontier, which is the supercomputer at Oak Ridge. It's a national lab, kind of close to here, actually. 
um, and has 8.7 million, about 8.7 million cores and uses about 23 kilowatts of power. So this thing is super huge. And it's the first XSCL computer. So this is like kind of one of these recent advancements in HPC, uh, which can do over a quintillion calculations per second. And Frontier is like one of the most uh, recent exciting developments in this area because now we can do even huger amounts of calculations faster. Uh, like I was saying, one of the goals for HPC is to do as many is to do like bigger computations and faster computations. So one way to measure that is through these units of HPC. The first one is called a flop, which is a floating point operation, usually double precision, unless we otherwise state it. So floating point operation is like multiply or add or stuff like that, like mathematical operations. And ideally, you want to do more of them faster. So the way that you measure the machine uh, in terms of is in terms of flops per second, like also called flops which is floating point operations per second, which is now like a, introducing a time component. And like I said, like you want to do faster operations, but you also want to do bigger computations. So we also have bytes, which is this notion of size. Um, a double precision floating point number is eight bytes. So like if you're familiar with C, like a double or a size T uh, is eight bytes, like a UNT 32 T is four bytes. And if you prepend some of these prefixes onto them, then you get like for example, kilo correspond kilo corresponding to flops would be like a thousand flops per second, or like mega would be a million flops per second, and so on. So right now we are at exa, which is here, 10 to the 18 flops per second. And you can also use the same prefixes for bytes. So that measures the size of your problem or your program. <coughs> this is what the top 500 list looks like. So it has this ranking and the system name, so for here, and the second one is Aurora and so on. And it has the number of core, and it also has petaflops, so that's p flops, and it also tells you how much power it uses. So that's the rightmost one. And people have been keeping this list for a while, so this is just um, a plot of the top 500. The y axis is the performance in terms of flops per second. Up is good, so up is like more flops, right? Or the x-axis is time, so starting from 1990, going up. Oh, we're not in 2024. So you can see uh, these three lines. Sum is like adding up all of the flops. Number one is the number one in the top 500, and this number 500 is the lowest one of the top 500. So that's measuring how much flops each one can do. And you can see that recently, number one is going above this extra flops line. And the way that you measure flops is through uh, LINPACK, which is this benchmark suite. And what it does, it solves this system of equations, AX equals B, where matrix A is random with dense entries, or is dense with random entries. And the main runtime is dominated by dense matrix matrix multiply. So the yardstick for measuring this top 500 list is basically doing dense linear algebra. Um, yeah, so the way that these machines look has changed a lot over time. So the way to read this is the y-axis is the share, which is like what percent of the machines have this property. The x-axis again is time, and it's a bit hard to see, but the different colors are the different types of machines. So like orange is cluster, purple is SMP, which is shared memory, uh, yellow is MPP, which is massively parallel, and there's some other stuff that I won't totally mention right now. But the main point is that before, like the early 2000s, almost a lot of this was yellow, which is massively parallel, and a lot of it was purple, which is shared memory. And in about 2000-ish, it started getting almost all orange, which is like giant distributed clusters. And the reason for that um, is physical trends, which I'll talk about later, and also the increasing size of problems means that we should do, uh, we need to do distributed computing, and the problem with, not exactly problem, but um, what this means is that previously you could program these machines using like annotations for CL programs, kind of like traditional shared memory programming models. However, in large distributed systems, they're programmed by completely redoing the algorithms and the software for parallelism. A similar trend, so again, this y-axis is the number of programs that have that uh, I guess that property or that 
that accelerator. <coughs> the way to read this is the different kinds of accelerators that are used in the top 500, and the x-axis is time. So you can see that this, these are like, these different colors are the different kinds of accelerators that are available. So like purple is, for example, the NVIDIA Vulcan, which is a kind of GPU, and that's like this one. And the orange one, this one, is the IBM cell. And the, anyway, the main takeaway from this is that over a third of all the top 500 systems now have accelerators or coprocessors like GPUs. And the actual, this is just the total absolute number of ones that have these kind of accelerators, but the total performance share of these accelerators is higher than the percent of them that have it. By performance share, I mean like how much, how many flops are each of these accelerators responsible for? Um, are there any questions? Okay. I'll keep going. So, yeah. So one of the main things that we're interested in in this course is doing science using high performance computing, which is one of the main reasons that people are interested in HPC nowadays. Like all the national labs are interested in doing HPC. And HPC allows us to do a lot of things that we couldn't do in traditional science. So traditionally in science, there's like theory and there's experimentation and you kind of go back and forth between these two and like really old school science. Um, but nowadays with computation, we have simulation. And the reason that we have simulation is that there's a lot of applications where things are like not possible to do with theory and experimentation. Like they're too huge or small or they're on time scales that people don't understand. Like they're too fast or too slow. Or maybe they're really dangerous, like maybe they're in space, or they're very expensive, so we want to do simulation for them. Recently, um, there's this work doing this fully featured atmospheric global circulation model. And this is like their picture that they did it. This is in this year's supercomputing. And actually, I think they made a new award uh, for climate simulations, which is pretty exciting. Um, this runs on both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs, and it runs on Frontier. So it's the first giant simulation to run on the entire exascale machine. And it simulates uh, per day of computation, it can simulate over one year of, uh, of cloud movement, which is really exciting. So this is one, so this is an example of simulation that people are interested in doing in HPC. Like um, you could measure these, I guess, like cloud movements, but uh, to do it on larger timescales, it's better to do it in a simulation. In Oak Ridge, another thing that they were working on is using computers to screen potential compounds for coronavirus drugs. So um, molecular docking, I guess, is some way to measure what kind of uh, compounds are appropriate for this application. And instead of doing manual testing, which would take too long and is really expensive, they were able to screen these compounds and identify 77 of the most promising ones so they can cut down the search space by a lot using simulation. Yeah, and there's a lot more of these applications that I can get that I won't get into right now, but there's accelerators, there's astrophysics, climate is a really popular one, popular one right now. People can do earthquake simulations, uh, chemistry, and so on. In addition to simulation, using high performance computing, people are also interested in doing data analysis. So data analysis <coughs> is uh, kind of just like just processing your data and it's used for data sets that are big or complex or fast. So there's things called like streaming data sets, which means like your data is coming quickly online. So you have to process it as it comes or maybe too noisy or too heterogeneous to do measurement alone. And if you want to get something interesting out of it, then you have to do uh, High performance and efficient simulation, or not simulation, analysis. Yeah, so this is uh, just one example. Um, this is a detector and a sequencer, which are like from genomics, and the y axis is amount relative to 2010. So, like at 2010, it's one, and this is the growth over time. And you can see that the detector, which is how much data, I guess both the detector and the sequencer. The detector is how much data you get, and the sequencer is kind of like processing the data from there. And you can see that the red line is going up way faster than the orange line. Um, so that's how much, uh, so the data growth is much faster than the computation because the computation is in green. 
Um, so this is processor speed, and you can see that it's much slower than the red line. So if you just relied on the processor alone to process your volume of data, it wouldn't work because like your volume data is way faster than your computational speed. Um, in genomics, there's a lot of other reasons that you would want to do analysis. So for example, like uh, if you're interested in like looking at what happens to microbes after a wildfire or this micro microbial dynamics of soil carbon cycling or any of these other, other applications. The main thing to notice here is that each of these problems is really huge. So like on the order of terabytes, this one is 1.5 terabytes and three terabytes and so on, uh, which is much bigger than your traditional problem that you would just run on your laptop. Like your laptop probably has on the order of gigabytes. So terabytes is like several orders of magnitude above that. Yeah. Um, and so like I said, traditionally we have theory experimentation, we have simulation and data analysis, which are, I would call them traditionally, more traditional HPC. And most recently um, we have machine learning, which I guess everybody probably has heard of. One thing that is important about machine learning is that it demands way more computing power than uh, the pace of hardware growth. So this, Axis is the amount of petaflops per day you need to train machine learning models, and the x-axis is like the date that the model was introduced. You can see that the line is going up. This is log scale, so the line is going up way faster than um, way faster than the total rate of computation that we have, and this blue line is exaflops per second for one day. So. Uh, and this is in 2018 and 2019, so probably if you projected this even further now, that would be even higher. And this is this is going up by like over 100x or 1,000x. But from in these like in a similar time scale from 2011 to 2017, the fastest top 500 machine grew less than 10x. So um, the training is not the training is growing way faster than the total computation time. So. Uh, this is another reason that we're interested in doing efficient algorithms because uh, if you just try to run these things on your hardware, like you're not going, the hardware does not keep up with the pace of uh, computational need. Oops. <coughs> so this is again sort of similar to what I was saying, just on a larger scale. So again, y-axis is the training compute that you need in flops, and the x-axis, the publication date of that model. This is again, this is starting from 1950, so the other one is starting around 2000. But um, for a while, it was actually, there's like, um, I guess this one paper was identifying three errors, but for a really long time, like from 1950 to about 2008, this is growing at a pretty slow rate. So this is 10 to the 4, and this is 10 to the 14. So this is like a factor of 10. Or sorry, this is a factor of 10 to the 10, but over a course of over 50 years. And now from 2008 to about now, you can see that there's kind of like a knee in this curve and it's going up way faster than it was in the previous time. But hardware is not getting this much faster. Some exciting science-based applications that people have been doing with ML recently. Um, these are kind of, I think they've made the news. So AlphaFold from DeepMind produces this machine learning based solution to solving the 3D structure of proteins. Instead of determining them experimentally, which is time consuming and challenging, AI can predict the protein shape at scale quickly and accurately. So this is really exciting. Like this is uh, one of the most, one of the recent advancements in AI for science. Um, yeah, another one even more recent than that is for material discovery. So again, from DeepMind, they discovered on the order of 2.2 million crystals, which is about 800 years of knowledge. So instead of manually going through the crystals and trying to do discovery, which is really slow, um, they used models to try to predict uh, what would, they used, I think, to part of like material discovery. Um, yeah. yeah, so why are all computers nowadays parallel? Like I said, the three things that we're going to focus on in this class are parallelism, data locality, and specialization. And the first one is parallelism, and it's driven by power. So this is a plot. The y-axis is like the rate of growth, and the x-axis is the year. 
So there's two main things on this plot. The gray one is transistor count over like a unit space. And the blue one is clock speed, or I guess transistor count like per chip over a unit space. And the blue one is clock speed, which is here in megahertz, but really matters normalized. And you can see that both of them are going up. And this plot cuts off around 2005. And this increase in transistor count is called Moore's Law. So for these about 30-ish years or so, it would double every two years. And there would be this accompanying increase in clock speed. So what that means is that hardware, like under your software, was getting faster over time as a result of like physical advancements. As an example of what that actually means, like with an example of just computers that you would get available like as a regular desktop or laptop. So from Apple in 1977, the clock rate was one megahertz, which today is unheard of. And it was about $1,400 back then. And in 2000, they had this advanced version that has 400 megahertz, which is 400 times faster, which is exciting, or a little bit more, like 1600. And in 2004, you can get one for 1.8 gigahertz. So this is like over three times faster than this one for even cheaper for $1,500. So what this means is that if you had software that ran in 1977 on this machine and you ran it on this machine, you just bought a new one and it was able to run, like over the course of 20 something years, you would get 400 times faster for free in some sense. Um, and again here, uh, you could get your code over four times faster if you just bought this new machine four years later, again, for free because you're probably upgrading your hardware just frequently anyway. And also the memory is getting bigger. So the memory here was 48 kilobytes, um, which is tiny. And here it's just also getting bigger at 64 megabytes. And in 2004, it was 256 megabytes. But one thing to notice is that the memory doesn't grow as fast. Um, Yeah, the memory doesn't grow as fast as the compute. So for, for example, from here to 64 to 256 is only like, I don't know, less than a factor of 10. But this, sorry, this here is like not growing as fast as the clock rate. Hmm? I feel like it is, right? It's like over 1,000 X to the clock rate is 400 X. Oh, I guess so. I think it's not going that fast now, maybe is what I meant. Like, our memory is now, maybe it is actually. You can get a memory on the order of terabytes. But the clock rate is not going up another thousand X from this today. So maybe back then it was better. Well, life was better back then because I guess the memory is also growing. And yeah, so the way that, sorry, let's go back a couple. So the way that we got this increase in clock speed was by increasing the number of transistors on the chip. Like hardware was able to make the transistors smaller, so they were able to put more on the chip, so the clock rate was able to increase. Um, but unfortunately, there are physical limitations to how many transistors you can put on a single chip. So this is like the power density, which is a function of how many transistors you can pack into space. This is the year. And as you can see, like if you were able, if you're able to grow at the same rate that we were previously, the power density would become way more than is feasible. And the reason for that is that the power grows exponentially in the frequency. So like the frequency increases when you have more transistors and the power grows way faster than the frequency and the performance grows proportionally to the frequency. And so this question, is it better to increase the speed by doubling your frequency or doubling your cores? Um, well, it's equal for the performance, but it's way worse for the power to increase your frequency. And so the reason, yeah, so that's the reason that companies came up with these multi-cores, which I showed you this picture in the beginning. That's why you have a lot of these cores in a shared memory, because they increase the cores rather than the frequency. And to scale the performance, processors put a bunch of cores on the same microprocessor chip, 
And now each generation of Moore's law potentially doubles the number of cores on your chip. So this is the same plot that we saw earlier, but previously it was cut off at 2005. And now after 2005, Moore's law is way more confusing. Um, the transistor count is not increasing as much as it was before. Clock speed is pretty much flat, and the number of cores is increasing after 2005. Yeah, so that is one reason that all the modern computers are parallel because of physical limitations. And this, this plot is showing us where performance is coming from now. So the y-axis is the number of flops that we got, and the x-axis is the release date of the processor, and these are the different processors. And yellow is frequency scaling. So yellow is like Moore's law and transistors. And you can see that this yellow is a huge component up in here. Like, there are only two components on the till now, 2005. There's yellow and there's orange, which is pipelining, uh, which I won't talk about in detail right now. But it's mostly yellow, and it kind of cuts. It's still a huge portion of the performance, but all the performance gains after that are not necessarily coming from yellow. Like, only a little bit here. After 2005-ish, the performance gains are coming from red, which is multi-core, blue, which is SIMD, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute and other things like superscalar. SIMD is this other paradigm in computing. It stands for single instruction multiple data. And the way it works is that a SIMD computer has multiple processors or functional units that do the same operation on a whole bunch of different data elements at once. So this is different from traditional multi-core, which is like you can have arbitrary tasks on any of your data. This is, you have to do the same operation on your like your set of elements. So like scalar just means like you have two variables. For example, like if you do like a plus b, this is a regular scalar operation, and you get some result. But vectorized or SIMD means that you have kind of like an array of data, and you apply the same operation on all of it, and you get results also in an array. And this is present in modern multicores. So most regular processors nowadays have SIMD. It, with two to eight way parallelism um, and GPUs use SIMD as their main programming paradigm. So GPUs have SIMD, but on like way larger scale, maybe like more than 100 uh, SIMD units broken up into some components. So the main point that I want to get across is that parallelism is now available and competing at all scales in regular multi-cores, like in your laptop, all the way up to supercomputers, and also like in your phone, um, even in tiny chips now, you have multi-cores and even, even tiny GPUs. Um, so no matter what scale you're working on, parallelism affects you, and it's important to understand how it works if you want to fully program for these machines. Yeah, but there are caveats when using parallelism. So this traditional, I guess like this traditional thing in parallelism is called Amdahl's law, which is a way to bound how much speed up you get from a parallel application. And the way it works is that you have some example application and you have some parallel component in it, but not all of it is parallel. And so the total amount of work is one, and you have S, which is the fraction of work done sequentially, called the Amdahl fraction. And one thing to note is that S is the work, or we're starting with an application done by the best sequential algorithm. So in HPC, you want to start with the best sequential algorithm first before doing parallelization. So using this baseline, you still have some sequential part, and then there's some other parallel. So S is the part that has to be done serially. One minus S is the part that you can do in parallel, and P is the number of processors you have. And end of law basically tells us what the maximum speed up we can get in terms of the parallelizable fraction is. So speed up P is the time that it takes to run on one core divided by the time that it takes to run on P cores. And ideally, you want the speed up to be similar to the number of processors you have. Um, if you do a little bit of algebra, it turns out that the speed up is bounded above by the serial fraction. And this exact number is not important, but the main point is that the more serial part you have in your program, the less speed up is available to you, which makes sense because like, 
at most the parallel part can be good can get p times faster, but the serial part will always stay fixed and it'll be eventually become most of your computation if the parallel portion is relatively small. So I said in the beginning that writing fast code is not just about parallelism. It's also about getting the most of your hardware through data, lo data locality and specialization. And parallelism is good. Like nowadays we have thousands or millions of cores on supercomputers, um, but uh, it's not necessarily going to, it's not necessarily um, the best you can get. And the reason that we're interested in doing even better is because like the faster you run, you can stop saving, you can stop earlier, so you can save time and energy and cost. And if you can run faster, you can solve even bigger problems more efficiently. So parallelism is one of the things that we'll be definitely talking about in this class. Uh, one of the second major things in today's uh, architecture is memory, which requires knowing something about data locality. Uh, so this is another plot. The y-axis is the performance, and the x-axis is the year, and up is good. So this is the amount. So the upper line is how much processors have increased over time, and the bottom line is how fast like memory bandwidth has gotten over time. Uh, memory transfer from, uh, from DRAM into cache. And you can see that the processor speed is going up over 10,000 from one, but the memory speed over time has only gotten about 10 times better from 1980 until 2010. So there's this over 2,000 times gap between memory speed and processor speed and memory speed improvements. And this is the main reason that parallelism alone is not enough because of this processor memory gap, which is this exponentially increasing gap between CPU and memory speed. This is called the memory wall. Uh, and it's increasing exponentially over time, which is the reason that we're interested in data locality. So uh, these two lines, this red one is transistors, Y is relative scaling, and again, X is time. So red is uh, like compute scaling and frequency scaling. Blue is the stream benchmark, which is memory speeds or memory transfer speeds over time. And you can see that stream is growing way slower than the red line. Um, so one interesting question is where data is involved. If you have to transfer data, whether compute scaling is relevant or like how relevant it is. For example, like if you're dominated by memory transfer, it doesn't matter how many flops you can do because uh, if all of your time is spent transferring data, then uh, no matter if you can do like infinity flops per second, you don't have anything to compute on. So that is data locality. And finally, we have specialization. Uh, there's a lot of recent interest in doing these specialized hardwares. So this has one paper, I guess, even a little older than now. But the way to read this is that uh, it's like a hardware paper, and they did a whole bunch of hardware optimization. So they started with RISC, which is like the basic instruction set that modern machines use. And each one of these data bars, like SIMD, Alfusion, I don't know what magic is actually, but uh, they do these additional optimization on additional optimizations on top of risk. So like SIMD is this vectorization thing that I was talking about earlier, and they measure on the left side how much energy uh, how much energy consumption you use, and on the right side the speed up. So the highest energy consumption is from the traditional instruction set, like the unoptimized instruction set, and the slowest speed is also from the traditional instruction set. And you get some improvement if you add additional optimization, like SIMD, like here you can get less energy, and you can also get more speed up. Um, and if you add like these other fancier instructions, you can also get some improvement over there. And so, yeah, but the last one is ASIC, which is the specialized hardware design. And with ASICs, one of the benefits of them is that like in traditional or in general purpose machines, there's a lot of other stuff that you might not necessarily use. Like in general purpose machines, there's like control flow and uh, like mm, there's a lot of ALUs and like computation that you might not use. Mostly is control flow, actually. But um, so ASICs get rid of that for your particular application. And this is one of the reasons that GPUs are really efficient because they get rid of like um, the general, they get rid of like general purpose computation and they only allow you to do like SIMD like computations. So that's one of the reasons that they can do a lot of flops uh, is because they don't have to deal with so much overhead. And you can see that there's this huge benefit here from doing 
more specialized hardware design, both in terms of energy and in time. Yeah. So, yeah, you can get, so like here, it's doing these fancy instructions in your instruction set, but you can get even more improvement using just specialized hardware. So, like I was saying, at the end of Moore's Law, we started with general purpose computing. We went to GPUs. Reconfigurable is like ASICs, uh, is like FPGAs, and then moving on is special purpose hardware. So nowadays, people are interested in building specialized chips. Like there's a lot of these now for machine learning, um, but also for other applications. And the reason that people want to do this is that the operations per joule, which is like the power efficiency, but also the total computational speed, gets way better as you get more specialized. Um, but there are problems with doing special purpose hardware, like they become less general, so they're less programmable and you have to, uh, and they're less general purpose, so like they don't work for all applications. Um, traditional scaling is coming to an end. So this is CPU single core performance, up is good, up is increasing, and this is kind of the same as the data I was showing you earlier. Up until 2004, we were getting 2x improvement every 1.5 years in speed just from a single core process, just from single core processing. And at the end of Moore's Law, in 2005 to about 2010, uh, there's multi-core programming, which gives us 2x every 3.5 years or so, which is not as good as it was before. Here was 50% a year, here's about 20% per year. Um, so it's kind of falling off. And now it's getting even worse, like with Amazon's law, which is how much uh, serial working in your application. And then again, with physical limitations, now we have like, you see 2x every 20 years, which is a 3% per year. Um, the main takeaway from this is that uh, this is why we're doing HPC and parallel computing and like data locality is because you can't just run your code on new machines and expect to see like the same 100 times improvements that we were seeing in those earlier examples. But actually, there's a super interesting paper recently. Um, it's called There's Plenty of Room at the Top, and it's about this. Yes? Right. Uh, I can go back. I have a question on the last slide. For sure. Doesn't Amdahl's law relate to parallelism, or am I misunderstanding something? Yes, Amdahl's law relates to parallelism, but these these are like hardware limitations, like risk and denial scaling. These are like physical limitations. The Amdahl's law is sort of like once you once you have the hardware scaling as much as you can, this, this is like kind of like at the application level. Like Abnormal law is dependent on your problem and your specific application and how much of it can be parallelized. So even if you have like infinite parallel scaling, if your serial fraction is high, then it doesn't really help you much. So that's what this is. I see. That makes sense. Okay. So this is where hard, this is where traditional performance came from. This they call this the bottom in one of Feynman's old papers, uh, which is semiconductor technology and transistor scaling. And previously, performance improvements came from here. Uh, kind of like from the point of view of the programmer, for free, uh, if you just bought a new machine like 10 years later, you would see this huge 10x or 100x improvement. Uh, this doesn't happen anymore because of physical limitations. So nowadays, the way that we get Performance improvements is from the top, which is more top level design, software, algorithms, and hardware specialization. And in this class, we'll be talking about the first two software and algorithms. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. Is that mm -hmm. correct? But, okay, so my impression is that, and this might be wrong, but mm -hmm. so you have, let's say, a, a single processor and you can run a program that takes like, it takes a certain time. Mm -hmm. If you have, <clears throat> N processors mm -hmm. is the limit to how fast it can run one over N, or can it go faster with like some cache locality magic that happens there? I see. So you're saying like, can you get more than the number of processors speed up? Yeah. Yes, in practice, but not like in in theory. Like speed up is limited by P, but you can get a little faster to like um, with weird hardware effects and stuff okay. like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, not always. Yes. <laughs> Uh, 
the question is, how do compilers fit into this? It's a really good question. Um, compilers are definitely useful and they can give us performance advantages, but not as much as hardware scaling has given us in the past. Um, I don't think I kept this in the slides, but uh, Moore's law was like 2x per two years in the past. And there's another law about like com general compiler improvements, um, which is maybe like on the order of 10 or 20 or 30 years, like 2x every 20 years or something like that. And the reason for that is like, it's really hard to do general compiler optimizations. And there's a lot of work in doing specialized compiler optimizations like domain specific languages, um, mostly domain specific languages. But uh, those are, again, specialized sort of, and they kind of run into the same issue as specialized hardware, which is like, it is good for one domain, but not necessarily in general. Um, compilers can do a lot, but uh, not necessarily all of it, especially as we'll see, like compilers have a lot of trouble doing locality optimizations because those often require like changing the data layout or changing the control flow. And their compilers, like they're allowed to take new optimizations in like the space of what they're allowed to do. And it is really hard for them to do. They're not allowed to do like data rearrangement, for example. So, but uh, sorry. So the second part of your question is like, how do compilers relate to like, can you do like automatic parallelization, for example? I think not quite seamlessly yet. Um, there are, I think there is some work that like, if you know your jobs are completely independent, they can automatically parallelize them for you. But like, I don't know any work yet that if you have a just like one single, like a C++ program, for example, like that can tell you like where to put your parallel, like your parallel constructs. Um, but there are, we have come a long way in like, well, we'll go into this later, like when we talk about shared memory, but I think the languages for shared memory are nowadays pretty straightforward, like OpenMP and stuff like that. Like you just add a small line of code before your loop and it like run it in parallel and you don't have to deal with like forking threads or anything like that, which is way easier than before. Did I answer your question? What about like hardware architecture? Yeah. New machine models and oh, these like new machine models. Yeah, yeah good question. Um, so traditionally, like in traditional algorithms class, you may learn algorithms to, or you may learn to analyze algorithms in something called the RAM model, which is like you count operations as like one cost one, and it co also costs you the same to access any arbitrary piece of data. Um, but that's not actually how computers work. So by new machine models, this means like more specialized theoretical models that allow us to model things like locality and how much it costs to access things that are farther away. And so yeah, I'll talk about that in the next lecture, like locality models and uh, how we can get like more fine-grained asymptotics. I think they talk about that a little bit in 6220 also. Uh, if there's no questions, I think that's all for today. Thank you.